Hello and welcome to this edition of the EV Revolution Show. My name is Kenneth Bocor, your host for this show, uh, where I have, as you can see, a beautiful red Ford Mustang Mach-E. Thank you very much for taking the time to tune in. Now, this is not going to be a full review show because I did that in episode 126. So if you want to pause, go back and watch episode 126, where I was able to spend a couple of hours with a, one of the new owners a couple of months ago of a Mach-E and drive it around and do all the specs and all the pricing and all that stuff is there. So I'm not gonna be doing that today. What I'm gonna focus this episode on is a very short one about the usability, the efficiency and the drivability of the Ford Mustang Mach-E because now I've got some time to spend with it. And I'm keeping a driving log of battery, state of charge, how many kilometers I've driven, the outside temps, all that kind of stuff. Just so over a few days, you can try to gauge what this thing is like in normal driving circumstances and how it fares. So I wanna thank Ford Canada, first of all, for allowing me the use of this car for a few days. And uh, let me get right to it. Now, the first thing I want to do though, is just say that I have a Model 3, as you folks know, and I kind of set that as the bar for a lot of the battery only vehicles that I test, especially where, where they're in the price point of a Tesla. Now the Mustang Mach-E goes after the Model Y and some other, you know, uh, all electric SUVs and CUVs, that's where it's playing. This is a $75,000 unit behind me, so it's not cheap. Um, and they try to compete in that space. So I look at my Model 3 in things like battery efficiency, charging rates, um, and then and overall drivability, especially when it comes to the driver's aids. Now Tesla has their autopilot, which is very good. I do not have full self-driving in my Tesla, nor am I gonna get it anytime soon. But the autopilot, which is basically adaptive cruise and lane keeping, is very, very good. And I always use that as a point of reference when I'm gauging other products and other OEMs vehicles. So I'm gonna talk a little, I talked a little bit about that in the last show, so I won't spend a lot of time, but I will bring that up a little bit on, based on more driving experience of what I think the strengths are for this when it regards to the driving aids and the battery efficiency and usability. So let me get right to it. All right, so I'm here um, on the highway because I have a road trip that I'm doing and I'm starting with the adaptive cruise and the lane keeping. I'll show that a little bit more. I did show it on the last episode, but it was only a short run. So um, what, I'll, what I figured is I'll do it a little bit more on the highway. So as you can see, it reminds you to keep your hands on the steering wheel every 10 or 20 seconds. Um, I've got a distance set for the vehicles in front of me. So it does keep that, that adaptive cruise uh, portion works really well. You can see that the system is engaged when you have this cloud-like feature, uh, this force field that it looks like with the uh, hands on the steering wheel blue mechanism. That means that the system is activated and it's on both adaptive cruise and lane keeping. So that's what those symbols mean. So um, I'm just on the highway here. As you can see, it's keeping a pretty good distance uh, from the vehicle in front of me. Uh, that vehicle merged a little while ago in front of me and the vehicle slowed down. So it, it does keep that well. What I've noticed though on the city, it doesn't work that well because it doesn't like the navigating through intersections. Sometimes it'll lose the signal or lose the lanes, the lane markings and it'll just, it'll shut off. Um, the, the adaptive cruise keeps going, but the lane keeping will shut off. And one thing that I've noticed on this, and this is a suggestion for Ford, is I really hope that you put an audible symbol or audible uh, noise when the system activates and when the system deactivates, more so for deactivating because you don't know if you're not really paying attention uh, and you're focusing on the traffic and this thing disengages, then you've lost your lane keeping and you may not know. Um, I found an, inc an incident where I was driving uh, down a city street to a four lane road and, and I was in the left lane um, and the car, I was passing a car to my right and all of a sudden the vehicle just did a just did a little swerve to the right like that and I had to grab the wheel for no reason. There was no shadowing, nothing on the road, no bridge or anything like that. So um, it is something that Ford and a lot of OEMs struggle with to get it as seamless and as smooth as Tesla has it, even in a base autopilot form. Now, Tesla's not perfect. One thing I criticize all these systems is that they tend to um, brake really um, hard or near late when they're slowing down in an automatic driving situation, and they tend to accelerate 
quickly when they're doing that as well to try to get up to speed. And Tesla is very guilty of that. I find that I like a smooth slowdown and a smooth acceleration, not this back and forth jerkiness that you get when you when you slam on because these have so much power. So Ford um, system does that as well. It kind of waits to brake a little later than I would normally do. So you're having a more aggressive stop that you need to do. Other than that, this system works great on the highway, but I would not use it in the city. That's my recommendation because it does, it has a problems going through intersections and some curves and it loses the lines. And again, the system doesn't tell you um, audibly if it's disconnected or not, if it's lost a certain function, whether it be, I can't see the lanes anymore, so I need you to take over. I wish it would. So, um, uh, sorry, the nav's on. So uh, that's my biggest complaint about this feature. But but for highway cruising, I'm doing a, about 250 kilometer run today, one way and back. So I'm going to do about, I don't know, I think four to 500 kilometers. For something like that, when you have a fairly open road, uh, like we're seeing here, uh, these systems are great to help ease the stress of driving. But when you get into more concentrated traffic or city routes, um, I personally wouldn't use the lane keeping or the adaptive cruise. I think it's too abrupt and uh, the lane keeping is, is a bit unstable for city use. Uh, but for highways, it works pretty well. So I'm here at Electrify Canada charging the Mach-E. You uh, see I started at 43% and it's ramped up to 125 kilowatts at its pulling. So that seems to be what it does. It uh, starts maxing out relatively, or a pretty good pull relatively early. I think probably when it gets to 50 or 60%, it'll start uh, slowing down to the 100 or so range. Uh, I only need probably about 15 minutes or so. I don't really need a lot to get back home. I'm, I'm just on the bubble now, so I'm gonna pad it a little bit, do maybe 10 or 15 minutes and uh, see what happens. But uh, good to see the Electrify Canada working quite well. And uh, I like to see the pull on the Mach-E. That's uh, pretty good. All right, just wanted to show everybody the charging screen since I'm plugged in here at the Electrify Canada. Um, you just uh, get to the uh, menu here and you get the settings and then it's charging. And as you can see, it's showing me the charge, 54%. Uh, it's not showing the pull rate, but it does on the machine. Let me see, you know, it doesn't give you it here and uh, all that kind of stuff. Now, there was something I was looking at to see what, you know, is there a way that I can select how much I want to charge to? And I believe it's under here, charging scheduling. And let me just pull that up here. Uh, it's a location. Let me just see. So here it's going to default. It's going to charge to 90%. That seems to be the default when you're um, at a station. But uh, you can program it for a, a certain station. So at home charging, as an example, um, if I look at home, it should be in here. Let me just bring it up. I did. Uh, so let me just see. Let me add a location. If I just say whatever. Here is where you can do it. So if you can call it home, and then here's the slider that you can change what you want to uh, uh, charge to. So you, you need to set up the location where you're gonna charge to, uh, if it's something consistent. So if it's a home charger or a level uh, one or two that you use all the time, then here's where you can program it, set it up, and then select the maximum charge level. Uh, because Ford, I'm not hearing anything from Ford as far as recommendations go on what to charge this up to all the time they let you go to 100 percent every day if you want so uh, i'm sure that some users are going to tell me what that is but the normal recommendation is you know 80 to 90 percent uh unless you're going on a trip then go to 100 so you know here i'll leave it at 100 because this is the location where actually i picked up the car or where they where they have it parked um, so I'm not going to worry about that, but this is where you will add a location and then put the, the charging element when you're fast charging You manually control that anyway. So a couple of things I want to talk about that are EV related So this is a trip uh, log for this trip and you can reset different uh, trips, of course um, One thing I like about it is that it does tell you your overall efficiency here So this is my overall efficiency since I got the vehicle put on 430 kilometers so far and I'm at 19.0 kilowatts per 100 kilometers or 190 kilowatt hour per uh, per kilometer if you do it that way so i like that it shows that it also says how's my driving you know how much how much energy was used for uh for certain uh applications for certain functions within the vehicle and just to go through quickly the menuing system um there is uh 
you know, different uh, controls and setting. There's different driving modes, of course. I've had it on the most economical uh, with one pedal driving on. Now you can turn it off or can turn it on. Now one pedal driving is just um, set at a preset level for regeneration and braking. I find it, if you were to do a level one, two or three type of thing for regeneration, I would find it as a, as a three, which would be the, the heaviest. Uh, I would actually prefer if Ford gave you options that you could control it, maybe dial it down a little bit. Because uh, if you turn it off, then there's absolutely no regeneration that I can feel. The car coasts quite easily um, if you turn one pedal drive off and you have to use the manual brake. There is no slowing down. It's very, very uh, gradual uh, if you turn it off. So if you turn it on, you get a fairly aggressive regeneration. And some people are going to like that. Some people aren't going to like that. You can modulate it, of course, with the accelerator as you ease off um, the accelerator. You can control it, but you know it is fairly aggressive. Um, I'd prefer, again, an option for that to select it to different levels. So that's that, but that's where you find it. But the menu system, I won't go through everything because Ford has pretty good online videos of all the menus, but there are lots of things. One thing I do like is the camera. There is a 360 element here because there are four cameras around. So you get that. You get a nice wide backup camera. The menu here are exciting. Um, one thing you do need to find. So I, it took me a while to find the access for the power lift gate, uh, which is nice because you can just push it and it opens. If you can hear that noise. If I turn the camera around, you'll see that the lift gates open. If I push that button again, it dings and then off it closes. So. That's a nice function, especially uh, during COVID times where we're doing curbside pickup and contactless uh, pickups and things like that. It's nice to be able to do that. And then the whole range of settings from sound to uh, charging, as I showed you, personal profiles that you can set up um, uh, with that. Driver assistant, again, you can turn on or off all kinds of different functions on here, um, all, all with, which is uh, pretty cool. There's a lot of granularity. It gives you um, vehicle information as well. Um, and then general stereo and, and units and this kind of things, how things are going to be displayed. And then on the display, you can change some of the brightness and, and uh, the way it's done, the clock setting. And there is a hotspot connectivity with this, but you need a subscription to activate it. This doesn't have it yet. One thing it does is uh, auto uh, over the air updates. And as you can see, this system is up to date right now for that. So the good thing is that a lot of the functions Ford has done is very similar to Tesla and others where they've put a lot of the functionality, less buttons and more soft uh, buttons uh, and menu controls, which means that they'll be able to upgrade and enhance the features as time goes. Uh, and then you have another sub menu system here, a smaller menu with some of the more main features. You can go to owner's manual as well and look things up. Uh, which is pretty cool. So I, I use that a couple of times, uh, especially on the nav side. You know, there's lots of uh, lots of real estate that you can uh, play with here, and the nav works quite well with uh, voice um, voice prompts and things like that. So um, that's really it. Uh, obviously, the binnacle display is pretty basic. All you really need is your speed and your gear selection uh, and in your range and battery. That's kind of it. That's all you need. This is uh, showing that it's in one pedal mode as well, and it's ready to go. Um, so I won't get into a lot of other details. Everything else is pretty self-explanatory from the buttons on here to the stocks. Um, and that's about it, really. There's not a whole lot of other buttons. There's a parking if you're going to parallel park and stuff here. And I just quickly wanted to highlight the range and efficiencies here. As you can see, I started out on a full charge with 425 kilometers, which I think is real good for this vehicle. I was able to get as, uh, as low as 150 kilowatt hours per kilometer or 15.0 kilowatt hours per 100 kilometer of efficiency as you can see in this picture and then if you look at the driving log that i did um, it's a lot of numbers so you can pause it and look it over at your convenience but i want to focus on the kilometers projected column and the kilometers actual and what i mean by that is the kilometers projected are what the bms system told me i had from a range and the kilometers actual is what i what i ended up driving from a range and as you can see the projected is less than the actual and that's a good thing. You'd rather that than complete opposite of that. You'd rather the BMS to underestimate your actual range than uh, than overestimate, and then you maybe get caught, uh, you know, in a, in a situation that's not so pleasant. So the, the bottom line here is that the vehicle is 
is efficient for what it is, for the class, size, weight, and type of vehicle it is. It's doing really well. I had, I had full confidence in the battery pack system in, in driving it around. Um, and I think these numbers are very positive and Ford's done a great job in building this Mach-E as a, again, it's a um, vehicle that is designed from the ground up as all electric. And I think they've done a great job with the BMS and the pack system. All right, I hope you enjoyed this a quick episode, a little bit more uh, in depth into the drivability, the battery efficiency and usability of the Mustang Mach-E. I hope you enjoyed that. Again, thanks everybody on YouTube for watching. I appreciate it. If you haven't subscribed, please do. Always humbled by my Patreon supporters. You know who you are. And I always am very thankful your names go up at the end of the show. If you haven't uh, got your vaccination yet, please go get it. Follow public health guidelines. Uh, we're, you know, in Canada, we're opening up to more and things are rolling along. And I know US and a lot of countries are starting to come back online to get some normalcy. So please continue to follow public health guidelines and get that done and keep watching the EV market space as all kinds of things are coming, as you know, as I say each and every week. So until the next show, please everybody stay safe and I will see you when I see you. Take care and bye-bye.